Coming up this week on Sporting Journal Radio. There's two batteries that uh, I would recommend. And even the amount of sturgeon that they allocate, that number is never hit. They don't have that giant bass boat where you can add batteries. I fish, I hunt, and always will. Broadcasting from the Al Clare Outdoor Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. We're not just a radio show anymore. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Could our days of fishing Red Lake be numbered? We'll explain what that means coming up in just a little bit. We'll also get a Rainy River update with Joe Henry and James Holst from Norsk Lithium and In-Depth Outdoors joins us to talk about his transition from the TV show to product development of lithium batteries and what you might want depending on what your setup is. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Maybe you're listening on the radio or downloading the podcast. Thank you. That's Dan Amundsen over there. What's up, Dan? Hey. Hi. Hi. David Eckhart over there. Hello. Hello. David, don't just don't be alarmed, but you have a moose right behind you. What? There it's is. Danger. Is that right? Wow. So supposedly our background wasn't good enough for you before? Uh, wow. I did hear some complaints. The, the the plain plain wall. I do have some mounts around me, but you just can't see them you can't in the see camera him. shot. So yeah, you have a hooster actually behind like you. Like the there. coolest yep. mount that's in the house. Yeah. <laughs> the office. We need to figure out a way to get that in the shot. And then a snow goose, a yep. Minnesota snow goose of all things. I was there when you shot that. Right above your right above. It looks like it's gonna land on your head. It does look like it. Oh, it's a snow goose. It's not landing. <laughs> <laughs> not around a person. Right. It's an adult snow goose. Yeah. That's right. Actually that one did the funny story with that one, Dan, is uh, it was me, you and Tony David, yep. the three of us, and we were starting to pack up we were climbing out of the layout blinds, and all of a sudden there was a single goose landing in the decoys three feet off the ground in front of us. And I was the only one that still had a shell in yeah, any Yeah, we'd gun. been standing for a while. My <laughs> gun was packed up, Tony's gun was packed up, and you were had the sense to not pack yeah. up your gun yet. I'm like, oh, here comes a goose. Shoot it. I know. He's, no, he's right there. Yep. About to land on your head. Very good. All right. Uh, welcome to the show. We got a lot to get to, uh, but first, Dan, who are the sponsors this week? Uh, we have Invergrove Toyota, the official truck sponsor of Invergrove Toyota. The official truck sponsor of Fish Hunt Forever is Invergrove Toyota. <laughs> when looking for your new rig, head to Invergrove Toyota. Haybell Heights Campground and Resort. Fish out of a snow bear on Devil's Lake or book a summer trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at haybellheights.com. Onyx Hunt, landowner information, public land access, and much, much more. Know where you stand with Onyx Hunt. Prairie Sportsman, the new season is underway, and you can watch episodes anytime at the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. And Lake of the Woods Tourism. Take one last ice fishing trip to Lake of the Woods or fish the Rainy River this spring, or book a summer trip at Lake of the Woods MN.com. Maybe ice fish on the Rainy River again. My things are going. Yeah. Uh, all right, no. we'll, tell, we'll tell you more about uh, what's going on up at the Rainy here in uh, just a little bit. But uh, we want to mention this. And, not, and to be fair, this just happened. I don't know a whole lot about this. So we're just going to kind of read a little bit about this post, uh, read a little bit from this post from JR's uh, corner on Red Lake. Uh, they had a big meeting, I guess, in the Washkiss Town Hall. They had uh, a couple hundred people crammed into this place to figure out what's going on. There's a couple of bills uh, in the House and the Senate about giving more land and Upper Red Lake to the Red Lake Nation. So, um, like, this just happened. I don't know much about this. So they're saying that this bill, if passed, would mean the end of the Big Bog State Park. No more campground. No more Homestead Park. No more public boat landing on the Tamarack River. No more hunting in the Red Lake State Forest. Uh, there, it looks, sounds like some farmland would go to uh, the tribe. Um, we'd lose, the county would lose some timber sales uh, revenue and more. So uh, we're going to do a little bit more digging about this. Uh, but if you want to continue to fish Red Lake, they're recommending uh, getting hold of your Minnesota representatives, your political leaders, uh, Stauber, Klobuchar, Smith, Governor Walls. Um, this, is, this was state ground, public land, public hunting and fishing opportunities that will be um going away so there is something something uh, something going on up there so anyway uh we're going to learn a little bit more about that but you could find that post that we're reading about at jr's corner at corner access that was on wednesday on uh on facebook 
So, hey, uh, by the way, up in northern Minnesota, we got a little tournament coming up on the Rainier River called the SGR 500. It's a walleye and sturgeon fishing tournament. It's to celebrate the 500th episode of Sporting Journal Radio. That was three years ago, <laughs> two years ago, two years ago. What episode is this, Dan? This is week 602. 602. We uh, kind of skated around our 600th episode. Um, David wasn't here. You were in a snow goose spread. And uh, that was our 600th show, and we barely <laughs> mentioned it. We threw a giant, massive annual tournament now for 600 and five for five for 500 and 600. We just, well, the SGR 500 just had such a good ring to it. I didn't want to change the name, but well, we, I didn't say that. But we just did, we didn't even celebrate 600. Well, I was snow goose on. I was kind of. I'll tell you what. I'll have a beer. All three of us getting well, David, you won't be there. I'll have a beer uh, the, there in the SGR 500. There you go to celebrate the 600th show. I like it. Does that make sense? So come and join us. Uh, we'll be based out of Riverbend Resort. It sounds like they're going to have some lodging specials going on for you. So give them a call. Tell them you're coming up for the SJR 500. Uh, we'll have a bunch of prizes to give away um, from OnX and some of our other sponsors. We're also going to give cash away, paying back some of the cash from the entry fees and donating money to keep it clean once again this year. It's a two-day fish donkey tournament, catch and release. And uh, right now it sounds like uh, three of the accesses we're open at least are open we're open and um uh so we won't be watching the accesses during the tournament like we were the last couple of years so uh i'm excited it's gonna be a great time learn more at sportingjournalradio.com look for the sjr 500 so guys i'm excited the show season is finally over and dan i know you came out and joined us at the northwest sports show did you get a chance to walk around at all nope <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I sat, <laughs> sat down at the Taz and Lake Lodge booth, hung out there for the last couple hours of Sunday, and then we went home. Yeah. So Trevor and I walked around, and I'm like, hey, Dan, we're going to go walk around. No, you said you were going to go talk to somebody. I said, okay. Well, that yeah. what didn't really feel like an invitation. I said, here's what we're <laughs> going to do. I figured you were going to leave me there to hang out at the booth with Barry, which I did. But I, you could have said, hey, you want to come with? Well, I, I was like, hey, Dan, we're going to go walk around. That was you and Trevor. We're going to go walk around. Yeah. I, well, sorry. I Next time I'll say, Dan, please come with. Well, let's, let me just <laughs> like if you and David go. I mean, it wasn't a private tour of the Northwest Sports <laughs> Show or anything. Well, You're welcome to join us. Say if, if you, you said, hey, yeah, David and I are going to go. We're going to go do whatever. OK. Sounds good. <laughs> oh, Thanks. Good. Cool Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks what he's saying is it sounded more like a statement, yeah, not an not invitation. A, not a, you want to come with? There's nothing there that implied, ah, I'll join you, or I'm welcome to join you. You're going to go talk to somebody. You said you're going to go talk to someone specific, too. So, okay, have fun. Well, yeah, I thought you'd want to come with. I, this is the difference, though, with like the, the way Dan and I communicate. Because I'll be like, Dan, I, I think I'm going to go fish today. Meaning like, hey, do you want to come fish today? And Dan would be like, hey, I think I'm going to go fish today. Can I come? No. <laughs> I would have said, "Can you? do you want to come with? I said, I'm going to fish today. But when I say it, it's like, Dan, Dan you're always welcome to join us. Yeah, you're welcome to join. No. Always welcome. Always welcome in my boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going me. to fish today, but, lucky, lucky but we're that's, taking that's, your boat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, you saying you're going fishing is asking me to take you fishing. <laughs> my, my boat will already be hooked up to your truck. <laughs> I don't you even a, know it. You got a nicer boat. Sorry about it. Get a, get a worse boat and we'll take mine. <laughs> I don't want to take your boat. Well, this year when we take your boat up to the Rainy River, we're going to take a actual fishing net this year for the sturgeon. We went and talked to the Stowmaster guy. Guys. And um, this is what we use up at Tazan Lake Lodge, too. And they've got a big one, 116 inches. Uh, so it's got a, a telescoping, 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 telescoping That's handle. Better. And then the net. English is a hard language. Like the hoop folds up. So it's you can stow it. Fold it, extend it, fold it, and stow it. So you can have one of those big musky nets or lake trout or sturgeon, whatever you want to do with it. And then it doesn't take up quite so much room in your boat. And the best part, there's a lifetime warranty on it. So um, since last year we had a little debacle trying to get a sturgeon in the boat, this year we'll uh, we'll get an actual net for it. Bring your own. <laughs> so yeah, we'll bring our own. Since uh, well, we'll tell the story later with Joe about the net situation last year Dumb. up there. Uh, one of the other products uh, that I thought was kind of cool. This is kind of interesting. Um, I 
this is more if you have a pontoon or a big deck boat of some sort or a, or a dock and you've got dogs uh, jumping off the dock and struggling to get back in all the time. This Soul Breeze, they make uh, like dog steps for your dock. And the, the, what makes them unique is that they fold up like an accordion. So you can extend them out to use them or you can pull them back up and then they fold back up into the dock and uh they they basically uh patented they they built this whole anchor system so it's like david it's like if you built this thing like it's super <laughs> hd heavy duty uh for dogs it's not for humans it's just for dogs i will specify that um but it uh it is- sounds pretty speciesist <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Uh, so uh, those, those are cool guys. It was nice because I was walking around the Northwest Sports Zone. I got excited because I saw all of a sudden I saw uh, duck decoys and dog pictures, and I was like, well, "What is this?" And um, a lot of guys they've got one. They've got a system that's painted camouflage that you can use off your um, like off your duck blind or uh, your duck boat if you want to put something for your dog to get in and out. So uh, that was kind of cool to see over there. And it was always good just to see uh, see guys and. Uh, man, Jeremy Smith and a group of us sat with Jeremy and we talked about forward-facing sonar and barrel trauma and all that. And uh, this is these are subjects that Jeremy has thought about long and hard. And he gave us his entire dissertation. For like, he's like, I'm sorry, guys, I'm just rambling. I'm like, no, it's good. Just keep, keep talking. It was really interesting stuff. And um, I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll talk more about it on his shows or we'll have him on this one to discuss it all. But in any case, it's good to see everybody at the Northwest Sports Show uh, last nice weekend. Story about a story. Yeah, well, <laughs> about as good as one of my stories. We'd need a whole nother show if I explained <laughs> what he said. So, I don't know. It was a good time. And it was about at 1230 at night, too. So, <laughs> there might have been a couple words repeated in there. I don't know. But anyway, Jeremy is going to come up later uh, with a video to watch. I saw a video that he put out about um, some leader material and some tieable leader material. This is a pretty interesting tip. If you're fish for two, three creatures out there, muskies, big northern pike, things like that, this is something you're going to want to learn about. We'll tell you more about that coming up. And uh, David has got his reel to watch from Mm -hmm. last week on Instagram. It's all coming up on Sporting Journal Radio. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. We're back. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Thanks for tuning in on the network or watching this on YouTube. I'm Brett Amundsen along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. Guys, how's it going? Good. Still good. Very good. Last time you asked. <laughs> I'm just, I care, Dan. Just checking in. I care. You're going to invite me, you can actually invite me to go do things or are you just going to imply? <laughs> no, me and David <laughs> have, just have this. something to go do and you're not, <laughs> you're not coming with. <laughs> no. Oh, man. That's fine. Yeah, I know. It's okay. All right, uh, uh, some things to watch, some things on the internet that we feel are worthy of telling you about, um, including something that we... So I signed up for the Linder's Angling Edge newsletter the other day, and they sent me a bunch of links to different videos, including one where Jeremy Smith uh, talked about a tieable leader material. Now, when we're up at Tazan Lake Lodge, we use titanium leaders when we're fishing pike out there, because I've watched those pike bite through, uh, you know, wire leaders, uh, fluorocarbon, I watch them bite through like it's nothing. So we're using titanium up there, but a lot of times we're going out and buying the pre-rigged ones. Well, what Jeremy had this tip of is tieable leader material. So I suppose he's buying it in some sort of bulk quantities. Spool or Spool. something, yeah. Then peeling off, he uses about a foot of leader material, and then he actually will tie it to his main line, which sounds terrible, <laughs> <laughs> tying, tying leader material. But um, depending on what size you're using, he explains the best not to use, how to do it, and then when you cut your tag end off, you'll have a real sharp piece of leader material sticking off of that. So the next tip that he uses, he grabs this uh, Solarex. It's an epoxy. So it's a UV cure fly tying resin. And he'll actually take a little drop 
of this resin from Solar Res. I've, guys at tie flies use this stuff all the time. And he'll put a little dab on that to smooth it out, cover it up. And then he does it in the shade because then once it's exposed to light, it cures and hardens. So he'll do it in the dark real quick or in the shade and then light it up and, it, and it's cured in no time. And now you've got a nice covering on that tag end right there. So then he talks about not even, he won't even use anything um, on the end, like any type type of um, um, snap swivel, swivel or yeah, or anything like that, or clip, he'll actually tie right onto the lure that he's using, uh, just to get it to run as true as possible, get the bait to run as true as possible. So there is a video for you to watch. Look for it on Linder's. I assume that was Linder's Angling Edge YouTube channel, probably. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, so go check that out if you're looking for something to help you catch some of those big toothy critters. David spends more time on Instagram than anybody I know. <laughs> a lot of time to kill. <laughs> a lot of time to kill. So we've got a group where we share reels with each other. And uh, it's funny because now it, it be, used to be just who could send the funniest one into the group. Now it's like, can I find one that David hasn't seen yet? <laughs> so David, what is your favorite reel this past week? Uh, my favorite reel of the week came from Sam Soholt, a public land tease. He had a... A reel that really connected with me about chasing turkeys, mm. and it's dubbed over from Tommy Boy when they're playing checkers. <laughs> Here it is. Chess match, but oversimplified the checkers. <laughs> I love Chris Farley's <laughs> look. There's, there's some days you just can't do anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they this always, is great. They I've never won three games in a row. I, I hardly <laughs> ever played checkers. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of easy to win when you um, never move your back, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Uh, Sam Solt's got some great stuff on Instagram. If you don't follow him, you probably do. But if you don't, make sure that you follow him on uh, on Instagram. Uh, I saw something else that was kind of cool. Dan, you, you haven't done this yet, have you? Go to the Prairie Chicken Lex? Nope. You were going to once? Well, it was a pipe dream once in college that sounded like a good idea, probably about 10 o'clock at night, and <laughs> decided not to go. I don't know. That's about it. Well, I saw Dave Pauly shared this, and um, Blue Stem Prairie is by Glendon, Minnesota, and that's one of the best prairie chicken lakes. Now, there's a couple of them around northwestern Minnesota where you can go watch uh, the booming grounds and watch these prairie chickens dance. Uh, and there's some sharp tail ones too, and there's some out east in eastern Minnesota, but uh, there's also some up by Lake of the Woods, which are which are really cool. There's a lot more birds up there, but this one at Blue Stem is probably one of the best ones for prairie chickens. And I've done it twice. I've gone out there at the Blue Stem twice, and I did uh, sharpies up at um, Lake of the Woods once. And it's such a cool experience. If you get the chance to go see it in person, do it. Uh, we filmed a couple of TV shows, a couple of Prairie Sportsman episodes. And um, you can watch those. But now they have a, a webcam set up that looks like it's running uh, 24 hours a day. So the window uh, on wildlife web camera is now streaming from a prairie chicken lek on the Blue Stem Prairie Scientific and Natural Area. What does it say? This is the second spring. Oh, they had the camera up there last year, too. I didn't realize that. So, Dave Pauly, we put this in the Sporting Journal Radio Insiders group on Facebook. Um, all this information. So birds are usually active right away until about nine o'clock in the morning. I remember just before sunrise, like they want you to get into these things before dark. It's honestly a lot like hunting. They want you to before get in Before dark, huh? Before, 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 while it's dark, before sunrise. Thank you very much. Just get in there at 5 p.m. and watch sunrise. <laughs> just down. stay there overnight, sleep in there. Uh, but you start to hear them while it's still dark. You start to hear them coming. And when you're sitting in one of these wooden viewing blinds, uh, picture, uh, like a, like a, a skid fishing shack, you know, fishing fish house with windows, like you're in a wooden structure with windows basically that open up. And when these prairie chickens come in and they make this booming noise, when they're, when they fill their air sacs, it makes this, this, I don't even want to try to recreate the noise because <laughs> you guys will just make fun of me, but it fill it's like this haunting booming sound and it echoes across inside that wooden viewing blind. It's so surreal. It's such a cool experience to see it in person and you have to reserve a blind. You have to do it way in advance uh, because they fill up very quickly. But if you don't get the chance to go 
And this year, probably going to have a lot of opportunity because of the early spring that we're having. There is a webcam that you can watch. And I don't know if you, did you pull it up yet, Dan? I sure did. Thanks for paying attention. Well, I was reading the, <laughs> I was reading the stuff here, but um, what's really neat about this webcam, cause obviously you can go on there right now and there's not going to be anything going on, but it'll go back about 12 hours. So if you scroll back, depending on what time of day you're watching this, if you scroll back to about sunrise before dark, before dark, <laughs> it technically uh, is before dark. It's always kind of before dark. It's a, if you think about that, it's always before dark. It's like when Unless they gr- it's dark. You're stretching there, Dan. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's like it's like the gre- you know the, it's like gremlins. You're supposed to never feed gremlins after midnight. It's always after midnight. It's true. It's always before dark. Well, it just depends on what midnight you're talking about, I guess. It's just it's before midnight. It's always before midnight. 1 a.m. is before midnight. All right, Dan. Deep thoughts with Dan <laughs> Amundsen. Shower thoughts with Dan. <laughs> so anyway, it's kind of cool to check out, and you can see that um, the Minnesota DEPA uh, in, uh, YouTube, so I'd assume that's the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources YouTube channel. There is the Minnesota DNR Window and Wildlife webcam set up at the Blue Stem Prairie in Glendon. Uh, right now, you can go check that out. All right, we got uh, Joe Henry coming up here in just a couple of minutes, and also James Holst. Uh, it was kind of cool to get James for the show. Um, we're going to talk to him about lithium batteries. Um, Dan, you got what do you got rigged up in your boat right now for your battery situation? Right now, I just have three batteries going: starter battery, two trolling motor batteries, which I run everything else off of. Not ideal. What do you think you if you got lithiums right now? What do you think you'd do? I have no idea. Honestly, I, I've not thought about lithium batteries for a boat that much. That's just, it's not my price range, to be completely honest with you, but it's a pipe dream. I really don't know. If you won the lottery, Dan, what, how many screens and how many batteries would you have in your boat? A lot. <laughs> I'd probably go into the store and say, give me this, 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 and this. Well, first off, you'd have a 22 foot fiberglass boat. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Maybe 23. And then a dozen screens. That seems a little overkill. A dozen screens. What, with s- at least eight live scope transmitters. Eight? <laughs> what you, do just, you need eight? You just cover the entire boat. You could just walk around the boat and cast and always see your jig because you'd have so many transducers. Well, so. let, me, let me ask you this, Dan. Um, how many batteries have you bought for your boat in the last year or two? Uh, one. That's it? I think so. You haven't had to buy new ones each year? I don't think so. No. Oh, that's just car batteries? Yeah. Yeah, I let a, <laughs> I let a car battery die just about every, all the time. <laughs> that, that is true. The alternator in the old Ford Escort's not the greatest. I feel like we're buying new batteries around here every year uh, for, for different vehicles and things like that. So maybe maybe we'll talk to James about getting... Getting a car battery version. Should I drop a lithium <laughs> in the Ford Escort? There we go. <laughs> that tease, that'd be sweet. All right, so we'll ask James what you can do about your boat situation. And if those batteries last a lot longer, you won't have to replace them quite as often. So uh, there you go. Just can be nice not have to charge them. Just worry about losing yeah. power and everything. Justify the cost. All right, also, if you're looking for a new truck, well, Toyota Tundra at Invergrove Toyota is uh, the choice that I made, and you should too. They got er, some really cool Tundras that they custom built uh, just for the outdoorsmen in Minnesota. So go in there and talk to them about it. And right now, they've got some new finance programs out. They got two and a quarter percent. So you want to talk about interest rates right now and how ridiculous they are everywhere? New Tundras, two and a quarter for 48 months through Toyota Financial, or four and a quarter for 60 months. Those are some great interest rates right now at Invergrove Toyota. Those will only be in effect through April 1st though. So if you're looking to get great interest rates on a new Tundra, talk to Invergrove Toyota today and we'll knock 250 bucks off when you tell them that uh, you want the fish hunt forever deal. Find out more at Sporting Journal Radio. It doesn't get much better than fresh perch and fresh walleye. If you're looking for an exciting winter fishing destination, come to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Hey Bale Heights Campground and Resort is on the ice with a fleet of snow bears keeping you mobile and warm so you can stay on the roaming schools of fish. Haybale Heights on the east end of Devil's Lake has knowledgeable guides, comfortable cabins, and their own lake access making your trip as successful 
and stress-free as possible. To book your trip, go to haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Well, it's that time of year. People are starting to think about the Rainy River, or they've already been up there. So we're going to get a Rainy River report and talk about Lake of the Woods with Joe Henry right now from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, how's it going? Hey, Brett. I'm doing good. How are you, buddy? I'm not so bad. It's uh, finally the end of show season. That's that's kind of the way I know your spring or uh, late winter, early spring goes. I guess it's not technically spring yet, I suppose. So the end of winter, it's kind of show season for us. And you're wrapping yours up too, aren't you? Yeah, I just came I just came home from Sioux Falls. I was in Sioux Falls uh, this past week. Uh, we had a, the Sioux Falls Sportsman Show. Uh, great, great crowd. Great crowd. Nice, nice people. Good, good Midwestern folk. Uh, Love their hunting and fishing, of course, and uh, but you know what? It was good. We uh, we had a booth, and I also gave seminars at this show, and uh, very, very, very good show, Brett. Uh, tell you what, you know, it, it is. It's kind of tradition. You know, when you come off that Sioux Falls show, you never know if you'll be driving home and see flocks of geese, or you're going to be driving home in a snowstorm, and uh, every year is a little different. I didn't see the flocks of geese I wanted to see, but I also didn't encounter a snowstorm, so that was good, too. Yeah, that's almost better. I mean, you should have probably seen some some birds. The waterfall migration is on, but definitely snow geese in North Dakota now. So it's uh, it's uh, some of the main mass is probably past the Sioux Falls area at this point. But I know the birds are the birds and the anglers are flocking to, to the Rainy River and Lake of the Woods to start hitting the rainy for spring fish. And I've seen some big, big walleyes come out of that river already, Joe. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, I You know, I, I talked to... Uh, Greg Jones was Greg Jones is a river rat, as you know. Greg Jones of Midwest Outdoors. He's a river rat, and he was kind of telling me he thinks a lot of those walleyes might have moved in in November, actually, after most people were done fall fishing. But you know, uh, those fish I think were already there, obviously, when when uh, ice went out, and you know, so we we got three boat landings actually open. We have uh, Birchdale, um, the next one down is uh, Frontier, and the next one down from that is Vitus. And I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, all three of those boat ramps are open now. I've been getting reports, and I'm not gonna. I don't want to. I, I I don't hardly want to mention these numbers because some of the numbers are just uh, unbelievable. But I'm talking about three people in a boat catching over 200 fish in a day. Now that certainly isn't going to happen to everybody, and you could go out there and even stub it, and not find the fish, right? But the point is, I've been hearing many, many, many reports of good numbers of fish coming in, and and some big ones too, certainly. I also have heard that maybe the biggest fish aren't ha- haven't come through yet, but uh, Boy, but that. no, it's been the spring so far, and we started. And obviously, this is a little bit early to start for the river, and uh, it's been great already, and I think it's only going to get better. So, um, I will say this: it's interesting too. We've had some, we're having some colder temps overnight this week, so we got some refreezing of the river going on. And what boats are doing is they're they're pushing out, just breaking that skim of ice as they go out there. And, you know, you got to watch your weather temps. You got to know uh, what you're willing to, to deal with and what you're not willing to deal with. You know, some people are willing to go out there in, in teens and 20s and, and catch a bunch of walleyes. And other people would rather wait until it gets a little warmer. So just watch your weather forecast. Know what you want to put up with. And if you get a chance to go, I should say, too, the uh, the walleye and soccer season goes through April 14th. So that's, that's kind of the cutoff. Well, and right before the end of that, every year we have our tournament, April 9th and 10th this year, the SGR 500. Looking forward to that. And, you know, um, this this refreezing and this colder weather uh, it may slow down the traffic on the river a little bit, maybe slow down the slow down the walleyes, which, you know, if I was going up there now, I wouldn't be happy about it. But I'm not going to be up there for another, you know, couple of weeks. So I'm like, yeah, we can, we can just slow down just for a minute. It's a very yeah, selfish reason. Anything. You can't control it. But I, I will say if three accesses are uh, essentially open um, or have opened up, it's nice that we're not, you know, opening them up as we're fishing the tournament again this year, Joe. It's just nice because it divides the traffic. You know, when you see the really, really long lines of trucks and trailers, boat trailers and things, that's usually when there's only one access open. And, you know, it's, it is it is what it is. But now that we have three accesses open, it divides that traffic up. So it's it's pretty much easy peasy. You still get a little bit of a walk sometimes, but it's uh it's it's a it's a neat deal this is tradition this is the first time people get to splash their boat in a year typically uh and you know for, for, often this is a time that somebody catches their personal best walleye 
You know, and we're talking a lot of walleyes, but uh, sturgeon has obviously become really popular. And we've talked about it many times. We filmed episodes about Prairie Sportsman, about the the sturgeon recovery on the Rainy River and what a healthy, world-class population there is up there right now. And there's a lot of discussion about sturgeon, particularly in, in Wisconsin right now. And I think it's because of the big, sca- big scary uh, spearing season, season that takes place on Lake Winnebago, which is an amazing fishery in itself and uh, managed for that uh, particular recreational activity. And it's been that way for a hundred years as a, as a way to prolong the native American tradition of spearing sturgeon on that fishery. But this environmental group has come in center for biological diversity and blah, blah, blah. We need to, we need to protect these majestic creatures and we do need to protect them and take care of them and sustain them. But we've got sustainable populations, uh, particularly there and also on the Rainy River. Um, this is kind of a like coming out of left field, isn't it, Joe? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's a little bit scary. Uh, you know, the DNR estimates that we have over 100,000 sturgeon, over 40 inches long on the Rainy River alone. Um, they actually take uh, they actually take eggs from sturgeon in the Rainy River and populate other areas with them. And, you know, for, a, for an organization to come in and to make a, a wide sweeping um, inference that we should s- stop all harvesting of any kind of sturgeon in the United States. I mean, it's, it reminds me very much of the old uh, same Timberwolf argument. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. if, if many of our states were able to manage the wolf population on their own, they would have a season and it'd be a very modest, very moderate season where they'd track every single animal and they'd, they'd be, you know, they'd, they'd watch it as close as they, they, they could, just like they did when they had it. But because it's uh, managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they're on a dangerous species list. Uh, states have their hands tied. I believe there are a couple of states out west, Brett, that do yeah. can, can offer wolf hunts and did they get grandfathered in they get special legislation what happened there you know? yeah they changed things i think i think wyoming i think it's wyoming montana idaho i believe somewhere in there and i think okay. wyoming when when all this stuff with the great lakes wolves so that's minnesota wisconsin and michigan when all this stuff was going down i think it was wyoming literally wrote a law that said you can't put our wolves on the endangered species list like the state tried to preempt what might be coming down from the feds and uh, kind of overruled so that they couldn't even discuss it. So they, they saw it come and they battled them for a long time. And, um, you know, you, you can, uh, we don't need to make this a wolf discussion, but you can look at the no. elk numbers in, uh, I think it was Wyoming or Idaho and, and see what happened when wolves were reintroduced there to see what happened to their numbers. And when you talk about sturgeon, it's, you can't make broad sweeping changes and protections because obviously each area and geographical location is different. It's like trying to manage walleyes in Minnesota. When somebody says we need a four walleye statewide limit, it's like, well, I, I have no problem with lowering limits in some areas because some areas need that need that lowering limit, but some areas don't. So it's the same thing with, with sturgeon or wolves or anything. Some areas, the numbers are better or, or lower. Uh, but these people don't care about any of that. They don't care about any of that. They just want to ban because they don't want to see anybody hunt or fish. And that's what that's what the root of this effort is all about. They saw the success with the wolves and what the Humane Society of the United States said. And they went from judge to judge to judge to try to get a lawsuit passed against U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to try to ban uh, hunting wolves and put protections on them. And they saw the success of that. They said, well, well, heck, we're going to do this about sturgeon. And they're going to go after wolves. They're going to go after sturgeon. And then the next step, if they, they're successful there, they're just going to keep taking and taking and taking until uh, their their ultimate goal is to eliminate all hunting and fishing. Yeah. You know, if, if you'd show me biological proof that we shouldn't be harvesting sturgeon that we do. And, you know, up at Lake of the Woods, I'll just speak for our area. You know, you can harvest one sturgeon. Um, either 45 to 50 inches or over seven, one over 75 inches, one sturgeon per calendar year. And they keep very close tabs. And even the amount of sturgeon that they allocate, th- that number is never hit. I mean, it's if you'd yeah. show me biological proof that we're hurting our sturgeon population and the sturgeon are, uh, are in trouble, well, then I would probably be for something like this. But, you know, uh, and, and to your point, too, shoot, we, we manage er, almost every individual lake in Minnesota now because every lake is so different, let alone having United States rules to manage any population of anything. Well, if you look at even cows and uh, the people that want to end eating meat or hunting or anything like that, 
the, the whole cows need to be protected and this and that. It's like, well, if we didn't eat cows, they'd be gone. Like they, they would either be eaten by wolves or, you know, they would not have the protections that humans give them. They're big, bulky creatures. Could you imagine running into one of them at, at 70 miles an hour running down the road if they're just roaming free? You know, mm-hmm. so many animals on this planet are populated at a healthy population because of their benefit to human usage. And you take mm-hmm. that away, hunting, eating, things like that, these animals go away. And that's what these people don't realize. Anyway, I could go on and on about this, <laughs> Joe. But um, let's just get back to sturgeon. Man, I'm excited to get up there. Last time, uh, during the tournament last year, I caught a 60-pounder during the SGR 500. The amount of big sturgeon that are up there in the Rainy River, uh, is, it's, it's amazing, really. It is. It is amazing. I, if I remember, that wasn't that sturgeon you cut? Wasn't that kind of a fiasco getting that in? I don't know if I'd use the word fiasco, Joe, but uh, maybe because you were the one who all you had to do is fight the fish. You didn't have to do <laughs> yeah. everything else. I remember, I, mean, no, I remember we talked. This is almost like a whole show we talked about. What, Danny, I'll, I'll ask you the question, Danny. Wasn't it kind of fiasco getting yeah. that fish? Yeah, <laughs> big time. <laughs> so the, I got my daily steps in running back and forth in a 17 foot boat. <laughs> the issue was that we were anchored and I, the ice chunks, the ice flow started coming through as I was fighting this fish. So I had to work through these big chunks of ice that were coming and surrounding the boat in the current. And then Dan was trying to get the, the, the anchor up and the trolling motor up. But then what happened and that, that, okay, that was a bit of a, a challenge, but the biggest problem was that David was supposed <laughs> to be in a boat right next to us with the, with the musky net or catfish and whatever big net you have. And they were fighting a fish somewhere. So all of a sudden now we're in the boat and Jamie Dipman was supposed to let me borrow his big musky net and then we didn't connect. So here we are up on the rainy river all of a sudden with no sturgeon net and maybe we shouldn't have just fished. Maybe we shouldn't have fished without a net, but I figured out we'll do a tail grab or do a a lasso or whatever. And we ended up tail grabbing that thing, but tail grabbing a 60 pound fish and trying to lift it (laughs) in the boat is, uh, is not easy, but we got her done. Hit the weight room. That yeah. might have also Absolutely. been. Oh, hit, the, I, uh, hit the weight room. Wait a minute. You're the one that couldn't lift it in the boat, Dan. You tried three times and finally I had to give you my rod and lift it in myself. Yeah, well, it's your fish. <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. That good, also, that's a good no, net, I, man. I was right tired there. from pulling up the anchor. <laughs> that also might have been when Joe and Greg had our net. Oh, they were borrowing oh, it too. Oh, yeah. Too. <laughs> Well, well, way we to play, had, way to play favorites. Well, that's what it was. We were borrowing, David, we, were bought, we borrowed your net because we had a sturgeon hook. Yeah. Yeah, yep, this year we're right. bringing we're bringing our own sturgeon net up this year. <laughs> so but I'll tell you what though, what what does that tell you about the sturgeon fishery? I mean, it's good. And this is all one this is all one block of time in one day, you know. Well, there were a lot of nice sturgeon caught during that tournament. I mean, a sixty one inch or sixty pound or whatever it was, that wasn't even in the top. You know, it wasn't even the in the running for the top sturgeon that were caught in the tournament. So I'm looking forward to it again, April 9th and tenth. Find out more information at sportingjournalradio.com. Look for the SGR five hundred there. And Joe, if people want to plan a trip to the rainy this spring or start looking to head for a summer trip, what should they do? Check out our website, and that is Lake of the Woods MN. Lake of the Woods, the walleye capital of the world, is calling out to you. From the Northwest Angle to the South Shore and Rainy River, this is the Midwest's number one ice fishing destination. Walleye, sauger, perch, northern pike, and eel powder. The fishing on Lake of the Woods is like a world of its own. Experience the most amazing fishing through one of the many full-service resorts featuring heated fish houses, ice transportation, meal plans, and sleeper fish house options. For more information, go to lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Well, the world of technology is constantly changing when you talk about the outdoor world and particularly in the fishing world. I see, I feel like every year there's more and more technology coming out that requires more and more power. And when lithium batteries came out, it, it was kind of a game changer. And we're going to talk about lithium batteries right now in Norsk in particular with James Holst, who joins us on the show. James, how you doing? Super good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You betcha. Uh, it's, and I want to talk about your transition from, from TV to Norsk as well. But just, I mean, when you look broadly at what's happened over, say, the last 10 years in the, in the angling industry, it's been pretty dramatic when it comes to technology, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, no secret that I think uh, lithium batteries have played, uh, you know, a huge role in it. Now, we wouldn't have electric augers. I mean, uh, you think about from an ice fishing perspective, when was the last time you heard a gas auger out there on the ice, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. five years ago, people thought lithium battery 
powered augers were kind of like a fly by night kind of thing. And now they just completely have dominated um, the entire auger space. Uh, I would say the same thing about like a forward facing sonar. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I had the chance to use some of the very first forward facing sonar units on the ice and you needed two motorcycle batteries to, to power them. So <laughs> I'm as diehard as it gets out there on the ice, but I'm not dragging around 35 pounds of battery and sonar. So if it wasn't for lithium batteries, forward facing sonar wouldn't be as adopted uh, as it is. And we're starting to see the same um, type of growth in marine. Um, people are changing the way they're fishing. Um, you know, it used to be in a boat, if you had two seven inch uh, graphs on your boat, you were you were king stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And now guys are rigging four, five, 12 inch screens and <laughs> what it takes from a battery perspective to run those screens is so different. And that's why lithium's really taken off. Yeah, and I mean, you could talk about power output and, and uh, efficiency and things like that, but I think just the weight alone, I mean, what a difference. I remember the first time I was at runnings or something, the first time I grabbed a lithium battery off the shelf and I was just fully expecting all this weight there. And I think my arm, you know, I grabbed it, my arm just kind of snapped up in the air like that. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I gotta have one of these. So just, I mean, just the, the, the portability of these batteries, I mean, I think makes them, makes them uh, worth it alone. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've got a 50 amp hour battery um, that's that weighs under seven pounds. You know, it's about, about that big. You know, uh, that's the kind of battery you're going to want if you're uh, running around out there on the ice with um, a live scope, right? Now, that battery right there weighs 1.4 pounds. <laughs> Tiny. You pick, you, like you said, you pick it up and you almost throw it through the ceiling. We go to sports shows and people are like, is this a real battery? Or is this just like a, a demo? I'm like, no, yeah. that's, that's the battery. You're like, you're yeah. kidding me. They feel so hollow. Yeah, huge weight, yeah. yeah. Um, huge weight savings. Um, you know, on the marine side, you're probably looking at 22 and a half pounds for a 100 amp hour battery that, you know, if you're talking AGMs, you're talking 70 to 90 pounds. So huge Jeez. difference. Wow. Well, I want to kind of talk about that and, you know, maybe go through some examples of how people are, are rigging their boats and how they're how they're powering some of the technology on their boats and what suggestions you've had and maybe what questions com- people come to you with. But let's just back up and start at the beginning. Um, obviously, In-Depth Outdoors ran for a long time. A lot of people know you from there. Uh, how many years ago then did you make that transition over to Norsk? So... I sold In-Depth Outdoors, In-Depth Media Productions, and my ownership in Norsk, um, November of 2022. Hmm. So not that long ago. Um, this is still a pretty new thing uh, for me. If, if you look over my shoulder, I still don't have my office walls decorated. <laughs> so <laughs> travel too much. But yeah, so just a real fortunate opportunity at a point in my career where, you know, I, I enjoyed doing the TV show, but uh, I, I've always been open to new challenges and new opportunities. So I uh, got a chance to sell the ad agency and uh, sold my uh, my stake in Norris Lithium Batteries. And it, they were both purchased by Seafoam. If you're familiar with the automotive additive company, mm-hmm. uh, they bought them both. So we had been doing marketing work for Seafoam for 10 years. And uh, they were always chasing us to, to do more work, you know, uh, to commit more manpower to their projects. So they finally got uh, sick of me saying, now nah, we probably shouldn't put all of our eggs in your basket. And they just said, fine, we're going to buy it. I'm like, all right, <laughs> throw me in the briar patch, man. <laughs> wow. So how long, how long had you been doing that? Oh, we started, uh, we, we, we completed 17 years doing the TV show, In Depth Outdoors. The ad agency... Uh, in-depth media productions. We started that in 2001. When I say we, that'd be my wife and I. So that uh, the ad agency preceded the TV show and just kept adding good, good employees over the years. So uh, we got to a point where the team was, uh, we were at nine people and I was able to retain everybody. Everybody that worked for me before the, sta- the sale still works for me today. So it was just a real great transition, great opportunity you know, miss doing the show a little bit, but, you know, so much of what I did for companies uh, behind the scenes was I would help them with product development and, you know, testing new products, new augers, new sonar units, new rods and reels. So this is very similar in some ways to what I've been doing for decades, which is kind of making sure to come out with really good products aimed at people that uh, enjoy 
you know, spending time in the outdoors. So that's what you're doing with Norsen. It's a product development. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, like I described myself, I'm I'm the, kind of the head cook and bottle washer. I do a lot of stuff, uh, but uh, I'm primarily responsible now for um, improving the product line, improving the product offerings. Uh, from portable sonar all the way through marine. So um, at ICAST this year, we're going to release uh, 19 new products. So oh, wow. I, I have been a very busy beaver uh, for the last, <laughs> since, I, since I assumed uh, product development, we've got a lot of really cool stuff coming. 19 new products at ICAST this year. That's wild. Um, all right, if we can, and, and maybe you're sick of talking about it at this point, you've probably been asked about it a lot, but if we can just back up just a little bit to the to the ad agency and the TV show, 17 years with the TV show. Um, I know one thing that you were trying to do was uh, stay, you know, turn, have, you had a pretty quick turnaround on that TV show, right? Like how many episodes were you guys doing a year? We do 26 episodes a year and we would turn them in the same week. So we would go out on, uh, we'd leave on a Sunday every week. Uh, we would uh, travel to our destination. Uh, we would film on a, a Monday and part of a Tuesday if needed. And then we would just hurry our butts back home, uh, get the get the footage back to the editors. And then we'd film all of our studio segments on a Wednesday and deliver the finished TV show uh, by noon on Friday. So it was as current as you're going to get with a high quality TV show. Uh, we averaged over the year uh, somewhere right around 900 to 1,000 miles a week Jeez. driving. <laughs> so when you see those shows we did, you know, we'd be out in Montana one week, and the next week we'd be in Ohio. We didn't fly. <laughs> so a lot of time in the truck. you got to really like the people you're hanging out with. <laughs> That's an insane schedule. Like that's an, like turning around a TV show, you know, so many of those shows out there do 13 new episodes a year and mm -hmm. they're, they're filming now to put out an episode a year from now. So to, to, to go out there, not only go out there and film a show, but go out there, find the bite, you know, figure it out. And maybe you had some guys out there helping you out ahead of time, but going out there and figuring things out, filming it, getting the footage that you need and getting it not just t edited, but getting that footage to the editor. Anybody like that, that travels like like we do knows that if, unless you can find some amazing odd, uh, internet somewhere, you're shipping hard drives or you're driving real fast to get that hard drive back or that footage back. So getting that footage to the editor, getting it edited and sent out to a TV, like that's, that's an insane schedule. Yeah. Um I have always been blessed with some great employees that love challenges. Um, and, you know, some of uh, what drove us was doing what people would tell us was crazy. Uh, we would hear uh, frequently from uh, other production companies within the industry and they, they would you know be very complimentary behind the scenes. We all get along great. Right. And they'd be like, we cannot believe that you guys do this. Um, and it actually would fuel us. You know, so there's some times where, yeah, we're about ready to break over here. And then you get that email from somebody that you respect. And they would they would send an email that said, man, been watching what you guys have been doing for the last 15 weeks and mine's blown. And then, uh, you know, you just take that and that's sale. You know, that's wind in your sails and you just find a way to do it for another week. And um, always took a great deal of pride in putting out some pretty high quality shows, you know, uh, taking and making sure that the quality was there, the audio was great. Uh, always had camera people that worked for us uh, that really focused on high quality media, uh, make it look good. And, you know, you can catch a fish, make it look great on camera. So those people still work for me. So we're now, we're, we're just doing great, cool stuff for, uh, for Norsk. Yeah, that's cool. Well, uh, In Depth Outdoors, you know, was a uh, was a good show. And then I still see I think the forums are still going, aren't they? The online forums, because I'm pretty sure we got mentioned in one. Yeah, with Aaron Weeb. <laughs> yeah, the barrel, the trauma, barrel stuff. trauma stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, back like when you think about Internet forums, I mean, you're talking 20 years ago when they were really popular, tw probably longer than that. Now, 25 years ago when they were really big and really popular. And uh, and, and most of them are gone. Yet mm -hmm. the IDO one is still there and we're still seeing fresh content out there. So that I think in itself is kind of a testament, testament to what you guys did. Uh, we've got such a great audience at In-Depth Outdoors and that's, that's really where I got my start, right? So um, I would feel as if I'm turning my back 
on a group of people that to some degree had a, a role in my success, right? Those were the people that spent time on in-depth outdoors, the website before TV was even imagined for me. So it's been one of my goals to just keep that place as clean and as special as possible for all the people that want to call it home. And I'll just keep keep the forums running for as long as somebody wants to keep showing up. So uh, we still get uh, over 2 million uh, unique visitors per wow. year to the website. So it it's, it's no Facebook, but uh, there's a lot of familiar faces to me uh, that still post some really good stuff on that website. So uh, it's not going anywhere. James Holst is our guest uh, for the radio network. Uh, we're going to go to the podcast right now, talk more, talk more about Norsk and lithium batteries. Uh, so thank you for tuning in on the radio network. Join us on YouTube or uh, Spotify or wherever you download your podcasts as we continue this conversation right now. You were working, James, with Norsk uh, when you were doing IDO, and then and then they just kind of took took over and said, "No, you, you, I'm the captain now. You're <laughs> working for me now. We we own you," and and started developing products for them so uh, how it all transpired was i did a video on the importance the role of lithium batteries in ice fishing and i was using norsk batteries at that time i was not sponsored i didn't know the owner and i did a like a product lineup i had batteries from dakota lithium and amped and markham and norsk and i just talked about the applications, why I thought they were really, you know, you know, something that somebody should really consider adding to their arsenal. And I mentioned that, and I used the Norsk battery. And uh, the owner at the time was, his name was Derek Asklason. He's from North Dakota, probably about 35 years old. And he tells a story where after I released that video, put it out on YouTube, he said he was on the treadmill running and his phone went ding. Ding, 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 ding. And those were all online orders. And he waited uh, a couple weeks. And that video, just one video, and I didn't know the man, sold out his winter's inventory completely. Sold him out. Wow. So he reached out to me and said, you seem like you're pretty good at this marketing thing. If I gave you a big chunk of the company, would you do that for, for Norsk? Because he'll, he'll tell you he's, he was not a marketing, that, that, that wasn't his thing. And I thought about it and talked it through with my wife and yeah, let's do that. So became a partner and um, built the company up. Um, I started out as kind of being responsible for marketing, but took over, you know, financials and accounting and, uh, and, and you know, just a lot of different roles. And the, the company really started to take off to the point where when Seafoam started to talk to us about buying the ad agency, I said, well, why do you want to buy us? What else are we going to do? I mean, Seafoam's great and all, but I want a diversity of projects to work on. And they said, well, we're thinking about buying a lithium battery company. And I went, you guys should know that I'm an owner of, of a lithium battery company. <laughs> and <laughs> it was one of those deals where one of the guys that ended up buying us slid his chair back about three feet and went, well, this got really interesting. <laughs> Six months later, they had acquired uh, both companies, and uh, as part of that transition, they, they wanted me to essentially continue to run it, uh, still responsible for all the marketing, and then they became kind of exposed to the fact that I've got some pretty good ideas, I think, uh, for products. So not, now I'm focused on product development, still running a lot of the marketing and the, and the, the team here. But uh, that, that's kind of the story. I uh, hope I didn't bore anybody, but that's no. how all the pieces go together. No, that's great. And I and when you talk about product development and you, you you look at batteries just as a whole, and then you see how batteries have changed, uh, lithium batteries have changed over the last couple of years. And then when you say there's 19, and I'm not going to ask you what your new products are. I'm sure you'll you'll talk about you'll release that as you get closer to ICAST. But 19 new products, like how do you you know what's next for lithium batteries? How many different? Maybe maybe just kind of break down what's out there right now. The differences in you know maybe the product line at Norsk right now. What are the differences out there? I mean, there's there's a good, better, best um, that people need to understand with lithium batteries in general, right? Um, you can buy some really inexpensive uh, lithium batteries that aren't built very well. They're using pretty marginal materials and cells. That's not what Norsk is about. We're going to be about making the absolute best product, period. 
Uh, we offer some really cool products, heated lithium batteries. I mean, lithium batteries will discharge without issue at extremely cold temperatures. And we're talking about ice and marine, right? It's, you can't charge a lithium battery below zero. So we've got, in my opinion, one of the best heated battery systems on the market. Fully automatic, uh, customer doesn't need to know anything. And this is just on the marine side. We figure if you're using a portable sonar battery, you can just bring it in the house. Not the case with the batteries in your boat, not very easy. So those, those marine batteries have just a wicked cool heating system where it diverts the current from the charger, warms the cells. You can monitor all of that process on the Norsk Guardian app. And uh, you just have the confidence to know that when you wake up in the morning, um, if you're chasing walleyes on Green Bay in the spring or muskies in the fall, the batteries are going to be fully charged and uh, you're good to go. And you really can't overstate how important this is because, you know, one of our favorite days every spring is when we have a, like a walleye or a bass tournament in the Great Lakes and it's cold temperatures overnight. The, the pros with all the best stuff, if they're not running heated batteries, they're calling us. Uh, they want to know what it's going to take to get heated batteries in their boat. So when those temps drop to 15 degrees overnight, uh, everything charges and they're, they're good to go the next day. So we just take everything to the next step, next level. Obviously, I understand fishermen, what they're looking for. And then uh, we've got products that are really tailor-made, super reliable, very durable, and the features they need to know that that battery is going to last the next 10 years. Uh, I mean, that, that's one of the selling points of lithium batteries. They last a long, long time. Um, I mean, thousands of discharge cycles. Uh, so you've got all the advantages of weight. Um, the lifespan is incredibly long. Uh, Lead-acid batteries can't even compete with it. Uh, so uh, you'll see more and more people switching um, to lithium batteries. Uh, that The market is just growing at an incredible rate. So apps have also kind of changed the game when it comes to so much technology out there. Being able to connect, like I can, <clears throat> my my Tundra, I can lock and unlock. I know when I was at the Northwest Sports Show, I, was, I had to run and get something out of my truck and I got all the way down 14 floors at the Hyatt, walked all the way across out to the parking ramp, had to go up four floors in the parking ramp and got to my truck and realized I forgot my keys. <laughs> And I just unlocked them with the app on my phone. Like, like it's insane. So when, when you're checking those batteries through the app, are you able to connect, are you connecting to the batteries or are you, is there a charging bank made by Norse that you're connecting to that is then telling you the life of all those batteries or how does that work? We've got the app set up so it will connect to every battery in the boat. Wow. Uh, so it's organized in a way that's just super convenient. You create groups, right? So you'll create a group for your trolling motor, uh, you know, three 12 volt batteries, connected to create 36 volts. You see those as a group. And we've just got some really cool features in the app. I mean, you're able to set notifications. Um, kayak anglers love this one. Um, it allows them to set a notification where they get a text at when the battery hits 50%, they get a notification on their phone that says, hey, turn around, right? You're in a trolling <laughs> power kayak. You just burned half your power to get here, turn around. Uh, so there's there's lots of really cool things you can do uh, to provide a lot more confidence to the user. Um, I mean, we're, we're tracking runtime. When somebody's running their trolling motor using our batteries, you can just do a quick look at the app and it'll tell you down to the minute at that setting, how long, how much more runtime do you have? And that's at like a, a consistent power, right? So if you've got your trolling motor set at six, it's really easy to, to estimate that. We've got another version of it where if you're on and off your trolling motor all the time, like a bass fisherman would do, we have a mode that allows people to track runtime over time, kind of like how your truck works when it tracks fuel economy, right? You do it over a, a span of 25 miles or 50 miles. That way, when you're going down a hill, you know, that says 99 miles of, you know, that, that's your fuel economy at the moment. And then you go up the other the hill on the other side and it says six, This it evens it out. So we're just all about providing customers with really good quality information you know you're out there it's a windy day it's noon you look at the app and says i got 10 more hours of runtime doing this put the phone away get back to fishing you got confidence to know that you're good to go for the rest of the day so that that's the kind of features and functionality that we're going to build in and, and build on to continue to add to our batteries to just make it much more user friendly give the uh, consumer the ability the confidence to know exactly what's going on with their batteries so is that, yeah. 
Sorry, do, the, do, do all your batteries connect like that then, or is there a line of batteries that you can connect to the app? All marine batteries do, and portable sonar batteries starting this fall will also have the same functionality. So everything going forward starting this fall will have compatibility with the Norse Guardian app. Hmm. That that would be nice. We've never ran out of trolling motor battery before. Dan. Oh, never. That's <laughs> never been a thing. Ever. But I have run out of live scope battery. Oh, gosh, so that yeah. would be nice to know. I, yeah. To... yeah, we've got we've got a mode and not to poke uh, take shots at any trolling motor company, but I mean there's some auto stow and deploy trolling motors, right? That if you run out of trolling motor power and you've got that trolling motor in the water, you're in you're in a tough spot. Like you better have a tool set with you because you've got to take the trolling motor apart to get it out of the water. Uh, we have a mode uh, in our app that at 10% it lets you know that you, you may want to bring that trolling motor out of the water now. That's brilliant. <laughs> so just, just really cool stuff like that to keep guys from just turning a great day into kind of a no fun moment. So let's let's get into some uh, relatable examples for people. If if someone out mm -hmm. there um, say I run a, so I run a, a Garmin Live Scope, and um, I've got a shuttle that I'm I'm carrying that thing around with me. Even in the summer, a lot of times because Dan's got the boat here, so a lot of times I'm jumping in with Dan. He's got his Live Scope on the trolling motor. I just set my shuttle up in the back, and I run my you know. So we run two Live Scopes out of the boat. I like it. Spoiled. <laughs> Very spoiled. I, I enjoy it. But I, I don't quite have the luxury of as much power as he does um, because I'm carrying mine around. What, sure. what battery would you recommend for a situation like that? Uh, there's two batteries that uh, I would recommend. You got the 32 amp hour and the 50 amp hour 14.8 volt portable sonar batteries. And the uh, both of those batteries are designed to fit in, well, every shuttle that we've ever tested, they fit in those shuttles. So a 12 inch Garmin with live scope will run for 17 hours straight, full screen brightness uh, with the 50 amp hour battery. Uh, and you'll see about 20 to 24 out of the 32 amp hour battery. So far exceeds like a full day of runtime. Yeah, that battery there weighs seven pounds. Uh, it literally has half the capacity of a group 31 lead acid deep cycle. And it you can put it in the palm of your hand. <laughs> so it, it, it is it tailor made for the guy doing live scope, forward facing sonar, you know, Lorance, Hummingbird or, or Garmin. It's just the perfect battery for that application. And what we're seeing, I mean, right now, we're shipping more of those batteries now than we did in the winter, hmm. far more. They're all going to the South, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, uh, the Carolinas. And the customer for that is a customer that's got like a smaller bass boat, smaller John boat, he fishes crappies, or, or they don't have that giant bass boat where you can add batteries. So they're taking these orange 14.8 volt batteries and you can get like, they cost 10 bucks, these little lawn tractor battery boxes. And they can carve out enough space to put one of these small batteries in their boat to run their new, you know, single screen, new forward facing sonar. And the customers are loving it because it's such a challenge to carve out space for an extra battery, even in a big boat. If you've got a smaller boat, it's essentially impossible. We've talked to customers that tell us, yeah, the only place I was going to put a full-size battery was on the deck of my boat. That's it. There's no other place to put it. So that those small form factors, lightweight, high voltage, man, that's that. it's an amazing product for us right now. I mean, we're shipping them all over the country. So that, that almost answered my question, but let me break this down. So I've got a 17-foot boat, walleye boat, so a little bit more storage in the hull deeper mm -hmm. hull um yep. i've got probably gonna read rig it probably do about if i can have my way probably five graphs on there three at the console two up front nine inch graphs probably um then yep. of course a starter battery so how many and what kind of batteries would you get for that so if you're gonna do five, all the same size assume like uh 12 inch screens i don't it, want to, that'd uh, probably be even yes i'd probably even go as far as they're as low as nine inch, but 12s if I really okay. had my way. <laughs> Let's just talk 12 inch. Sure. I mean, that's yeah. obviously, that's a dream boat, yeah. right? So uh, you're at about three amps per screen. And if you're gonna do five of them, that's about 15 amps. So um, 
if you're going to fish eight hours at 15 amps, you know, you're going to need 100 amp hours of dedicated, or right around 100 amp hours of dedicated power uh, to run those screens uh, all day, full screen brightness. So uh, that's what I would recommend. I mean, you're going to be looking at like a group 27 or a group 31 battery that can power all five of those screens. Because, you know, if you were to have them on all day long, you know, 15 amps times eight hours, um, that's 120 amps of power in an eight hour day. Um, I would go and recommend like a 100 amp hour uh, dedicated house battery. And uh, when I say house, what I mean is that that's the battery that's going to be used to power nothing but your sonar units, right? Your screens, your sonar modules, and of course the sonar modules provide the power to the transducers. And the reason you do that is it's, it's clean power. You're not adding in pumps, interference from pumps and, and VHF radios and speakers. So you're gonna really maximize your runtime and the performance of your units. And then what I would recommend you do is add a DC to DC charger. Um, so that goes from your starting battery mm. and then um, diverts current over to that house battery. Uh, they're really inexpensive. You can get a good one for 125 bucks and they'll deliver when you're on plane cruising from one spot to the next. I mean, depending on the model, you're looking at 12 to 15 amps delivered to that house battery. So you're just constantly replenishing it. So you never have to worry about running short on power. Uh, even, you know, June long days, you're never going to run out of power. Really? So it's just a really simple solution. You had one battery going to weigh somewhere in the range of 22 to 25 pounds uh, you add that DC to DC charger, which is just a, like a next level boost of confidence that, you know, hey, if I move from spot to spot, I'm not just wasting that opportunity. I'm harvesting some current and, and delivering it to that battery and you're going to be perfect. Good to go. Sure. Well, that's good because we take trips to Canada, too, that you might not mm -hmm. have power to plug in at night. So you got to mm -hmm. got to maximize your stuff with that. Um, and then what about trolling motor batteries? What would you recommend? So I've got like a 24 volt trolling motor battery. What would you, uh, what'd be your go-to for just your kind of standard, like Minn Kota Tarova for a guy who's got that for average day of fishing? I always start with uh, what guys have for chargers, right? So if you're, if you have a charger on board right now, if you're fishing a 24 volt system, I assume you've got a, a, a two bank charger, um, or two banks from a charger yep. that, that are all putting 12 volts. So I would, I would just ask you, hey, what, what charger are you using? Most chargers produced in the last six, seven years are lithium compatible. I don't like the idea of throwing out a perfectly good charger to switch battery types. And, and what I'm getting at is if you've got a compatible charger that can charge two batteries at 12 volts and it's lithium, lithium compatible, stick with 12 volt batteries. So you get two of those to make 24 volts uh, I would recommend a group 27 at 100 amp hour. Uh, you'd have 100 amp hours at 24 volts, and you cannot run that dead in a day. Put it on 10 and go, brother. I mean, you just can't. <laughs> uh, now, if the charger is not lithium compatible, well, then it's dealer's choice at that point. We, I mean, we make a really good 24 volt battery and sell a charger um, for that battery. But I, like I said, I just don't like the idea of throwing out a good charger if you've got one. So that's the first question I always ask. If your charger is lithium compatible, stick with it. Uh, it'll work really well with the lithium batteries and it'll save you a bunch of boat rigging. I mean, uh, that's one of my least favorite things to do. I'd much rather be fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't like cut up hands and just thrown yeah. tools I all mean, over the place. To fish I, I'm just sitting here jonesing <laughs> over my next fiberglass burn. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So I, I got a story to tell you guys. I don't, I'll, I'll keep it as succinct as possible. So I've got a Warrior 238, and on that boat, um, I've got a, a starting battery, lithium starting battery, a lithium house battery, and three 12-volt lithium batteries. I went up to Nipigon this last summer for a seven-day trip. Huge water. I think it's three million acres. And you make really long boat runs. And in that boat, I have three DC to DC chargers that go from my starting bo uh, battery, one to each of my trolling motor batteries. And because of the length of the runs, my trolling or my starting battery was always full, right? The alternator is huge on my, my outboard. It, it charges the starting battery up super fast. And then it takes that extra current and diverts it to the trolling motor batteries. 
I never had to charge my boat for a week. Wow. <laughs> That's Which insane. is good because there's no place to charge it. Yeah. Right. Insane. Yeah. That is, uh, that is, I mean, if, if you're going to have that much technology and you're going to spend that much time on the water, being able to recharge that stuff, you have to, you have to find a way to be able to keep using that technology, particularly if you're, if you've grown accustomed to using it, you know, that's the thing now, especially with forward facing sonar. And I don't know, obviously I, I'd assume I know how you stand on forward facing sonar and the use of it in today's angling world. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if I don't like, it's just like ice fishing with flashers. When, when flashers started to get more and more, you know, common, once I started using a flasher, it's like, well, I'm not going to go ice fishing if I don't have my flasher, you know, or some sort of electronics with. Now it's with forward facing sonar. And if I, even if I'm, there's three of us in a boat, I want to have my, my live scope with me. <laughs> uh, that's just the way, I, you know, I've grown accustomed to fish now. And maybe it's, maybe I'm a little spoiled with it now a little bit, but uh, if you're going to, if that's the way you like to fish, you got to find ways to keep that stuff charged and powered up. Absolutely. And, and I know there's a big debate around forward facing sonar, but I mean, my, my take on it is this, if it's a slippery slope, you start wanting to talk, take away technology from people. Uh, I am, I will adamantly defend the point that I think the internet has done more yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to put pressure on fish stocks than anything. So I'm, I'm a website guy. That's where I found, that's my roots. That would have to go too. And then what about lake maps? Yeah. Huge impact. So I, I don't want to rehash this too much, but man, forward facing sonar is just another tool in a long line of tools. You start pointing fingers at one tool, you got to point it at all of them. And uh, none of us are going to like the results of that. No. Well, and just going back to keeping things charged, like if, if you're in a remote place or like the Northwest angle, especially the Ontario side of Lake of the Woods, where you need a map to get where you're going, if you lose your power, you know, it's that could be, get dangerous for someone. You either don't see a reef that's marked or you lose your trail and you can't find your way back. And maybe it's good to keep an old paper map in your boat just in case. But uh, if you lose your charge on that stuff, you could run into some problems. You know, that, that's one thing. I think a lot of people that are arguing against, you know, technology, they forget about all the safety. Yeah. You know, it's it's guys that, that they used a, a rock tied to a rope to determine where the reef was, you know, or, or lined up, you know, to, between two points. Um, those days obviously are long gone, but those guys also didn't go out when you had three foot waves, you know, or you didn't, you didn't fish on a lot of days or if there was a storm coming. I mean, you didn't know about it until you were in it. A lot of times the so technology is, is I, to me, the benefits of technology outweigh any sort of negative impact. And my my stance on live scope and forward facing sonar has always been they're still not automatically catching the fish for you. You know, no. that you still have to catch the fish. And as the example we've used many times, Dan and I fished a little tournament here last summer and we sat on a pot of fish for an hour and didn't catch any of them. And then, you know, we could have moved and gone somewhere else where people were catching fish. We they had some active fish. And uh, when we moved, we caught some nice ones and might have done it a lot, done a lot better. And there we barely used the technology when we caught those fish. So yeah. in that sense, the technology was kind of a negative for us. But we've all had days where you just get sick of staring at fish that I like, swim by. I, yeah. I, I, I want to break this thing. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, James, um, man, it's, it's, it's a neat story and, and lithium batteries are, uh, are game changers for sure. And you said 19 new products, um, mm -hmm. for ICAST this year. When, when we, we, do we have to wait for ICAST to learn about them or we start sneaking some of the stuff out just prior or what, when, what do you think, uh, when, when can we start hearing about some of it? Oh, we will be teasing the world uh, <laughs> it's gonna start well, well before ICAST. So sure. uh, it's too soon now, but uh, you guys should have me back after ICAST. We'll talk about, you know, what, what we rolled out and uh, how things turned out and what's what's been awesome and what I screwed up on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Making products, they're not all going to be winners. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, and, and we'd be happy to. And, and real quick here, maybe last question, unless you guys got something. Um what what is either the weirdest setup you've seen or the most creative use of batteries you've seen in a boat? Well, I mean, uh, Nolan Sprangler, if you got if you guys know who he is, he holds the Minnesota State Muskie record. He's been he been running our batteries before I even knew who he was. Um, I think he's got nine batteries in his boat.
<laughs> so, <laughs> wow. The guy runs six, seven, eight screens, half dozen live scope transducers. From a fishing standpoint, that is the single most extreme scenario that I've ever seen. And he's always looking to add more. Uh, so uh, from a fishing standpoint, that's the craziest. Uh, we have talked um, to people here on the customer service line looking to make their hover round go really fast. <laughs> Electric scooters. And we're, we're just like, no, we're, we're, we're not, we're not participating in this madness. Please send us pictures or video when you're done, but we can't help you. So uh, people are always looking for a competitive edge, even in scenarios where it just shocks you. So uh, we, we get some fun phone calls over here. I bet. All right. Well, good luck uh, with everything. Good luck at ICAST this year. Uh, lith uh, NorskLithium.com is the website. James Holst, thanks for the time today on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure, pleasure guys. Have a great day. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com.